Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a pleasure to introduce Professor Bill Cannon from Durham University. Um, Professor Cannon is PhD in computational physics from the University of Edinburgh, and uh, she is actually have a rather international trajectory. She has been uh, working in different places. And uh, we actually um, met during a conference in Glasgow, but she probably doesn't remember me. Uh, it was many years ago, and uh, she located probably in 2004, that uh, was when I was a postdoc there. And actually, she was also before working uh, at Strathclyde. So she has been in uh, Glasgow, London, Leeds, before arriving finally to Durham in 2014. And she's an expert in computation, and in particular in uh, different non-conventional approaches, and uh, we will see today a uh, prominent example. And uh, she's known for applying quantum version of random works, uh, works to quantum computing. And I've seen also she's leading uh, this uh, collaborative computational project on quantum computing. That seems to be a quite active initiative. I am actually uh, registered and I'm receiving uh, communication emails from this kind of activity she's, uh, she's uh, organizing. And, uh, this is very interesting. She's been developing quantum computing and application for the past 20 years, focusing on underpinning science and computation and pushing the boundaries of computation beyond conventional paradigms. So it is a pleasure to have Viv Kendon here today and I leave the floor to her presentation. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to give a seminar for you. Um, so, uh, first slide, I always make sure I credit my collaborators and students before we start, so it doesn't get squeezed at the end. Um, so the work I'm going to talk about, actually, the, well, my work on quantum walks goes back a long time before these people, um, but I've picked these, these people out as key for some of the, the main results I will talk about. Uh, so James Morley was a PhD student at UCL. Uh, Sugato was supervising. This was actually a, a master's project that contributed uh, to the work. Um, Adam was my PhD student, although he was actually at Imperial. He's now graduated and he's working as a postdoc at UCL. Uh, Gemma and Steph are my current PhD students. Um, and Nick Chancellor, um, who is a, a research scientist at Durham, is, has also contributed a lot to the work um, shown here. So some pieces of the work are also were in collaboration with Don Horsman, who is not currently at Grenoble, but moving to Oxford, and Susan Stepney at York, um, who is chair of a, uh, an in similar interdisciplinary uh, Institute for the Science of Complex Systems. Um, so, and you will see where the collaborative work comes in that I, that I do with her. This is an ongoing collaboration. So um, let's get started. This is about how to compute using quantum versions of random walks. So I guess the first thing to do is to make sure we have basic definitions so we know what we're talking about. So for a classical random walk on a line, this should be familiar to everyone. Um, this is my little walker here. We started at zero um, for just it's arbitrary. You have to start somewhere. Um, you toss a coin with heads or tails. You move left or right. Um, and so you repeat this and measure the position of the walker after T steps. Um, you cannot, of course, go further than minus T or plus T in that time. Recording in progress. Aha. Oh, I got muted by mistake. I'm back. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> No. Sorry, we knew the participants. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> no problem. Anyway, so so if you repeat the, the walk many times, of course, you, you have a probability distribution for the, the outcomes, the final positions, and it's a binomial and it has a standard deviation that is the square root um, of 
the number of steps that you took. All this is very well known. So now what we would like is a quantum version of this. So here we go. Here is my little walker again. Now a quantum walker, so it can be in a superposition of positions on here. So again, we start at the origin, but now we toss a quantum coin. And so in this case, we're going to, to do a Hadamard operation. We rotate, rotate the zero to zero plus one, and rotate the one to zero minus one. And you can see if you measure either of these, they have this equal probability of being zero or one, so like heads or tails. So then we move left and right in superposition according to this qubit um, state here. So now we have a walk that is spreading out in position with superposition of different positions. So we carry on with the same recipe. We repeat the steps for t times. We measure the position of the walker. And if you measure, you will find one position out of all the possible ones. You repeat it many times and you get a probability distribution. And here is the comparison. So there's the binomial for the classical walk. And this spiky thing that is a bit like a discrete airy function is what you get for the probability distribution of the quantum walk. And when you calculate the standard deviation, you find that it's linear compared to the square root you get for classical. It has been analytically solved in about six different ways. Um, and since the interest in these walks started around 2000, there are now many thousands of publications and many different angles that people have taken um, to study these walks. And I could spend a whole course talking about them, but I'm going to try to focus the seminar on some of the work that I have done more recently. Um, so the first thing to say to do next is to introduce the continuous time version of the quantum walk. So just like classical walks, you can have a con one that is um, moving in continuous time, not in discrete steps. Um, so this one was um, introduced thing thinking computationally, again, a little before 2000, actually before the, the, the coined version. Um, so we take a, a graph with an adjacency matrix, um, where of course the, the entries are one if there's an edge between the sites J and K. And then it's an undirected graph, the matrix, the adjacency matrix is symmetric. So you can make a Hamiltonian from this. You have a hopping rate um, time the times the entries in the matrix. Gamma is the transition rate, the probability of moving to a connected site per unit time. And then you simply do that the walk is following the Schrodinger equation. We just use the Hamiltonian, so we evolve it of the initial position as e to the minus i h t. Um, I'm taking units where h bar is one to keep the notation simple. And then of course you just measure at time t to see what your walk looks like. Um, and it looks, um, it looks very like this one. I haven't put the slide in with the plot, but it essentially gives you a similar kind of pattern. Um, and you was, as you would expect, there is a way to take the limit of the discrete time walk and make it turn into the continuous time walk. If you do the limit in the right way, here's the reference from 2006, you get two copies of the continuous time walk because of course you've got a, a coin here, you've got an extra degree of freedom. So the Hilmut space is twice the size. There's no coin in the continuous time one. There's another way to take the limit with a lazy quantum walk and, um, in this paper here. So that's the quantum walks I want to talk about, the basic definitions. Um, so here's an overview then of my talk. So first I want to talk a little bit about modeling versus simulation. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about what we mean by computation. 
So I'm going to go on an excursion and come back to the quantum walks about halfway through the talk, because using them to compute is quite a specific thing to do. And um, you don't want to get muddled up with using them for other things. And there are many other things you can use a, a quantum walk for to model physical processes, to um, um, and just to study the mathematical physics of them, um, to study them on, on different graphs or structures or whatever. Um, and I'm going to focus in then on to quite specifically using them to get a computational advantage, um, applying them to problems like spin glasses, for example. And then at the end, I will put it in context of universal quantum computing using quantum walks and a little bit of a summary. So hold those simple definitions of quantum walks in your mind and let's dive into thinking about computation more generally. Um, so first of all, and this should be at some level obvious, but worth reminding ourselves of, when we simulate, when we compute something with a computer, we only compute the mathematical models. We don't co compute physical systems. That, that's a cat, sort of category error. Um, so this is a little diagram thinking how experiments, analytical calculations, and numerical simulation are all to do with understanding the mathematical models we make of, in the case of physics, a physical system, we can compare them and revise our model. So what we do when we're doing computational physics is we're testing models in cases where we can't easily do analytical tests because the maths is too hard. Um, and again, at some level, this should be obvious. There's a difference between a physical system and an algorithm. Um, so here's a little, um, table where we've got physical systems doing quantum walks or classical walks. Um, so we can have a, an atom trapped in an optical lattice and make it do a quantum walk. Um, there are board games that are certainly some kind of random walk. You throw a dice and then move according to the random number that it tells you. And then if you'd want to take a computer, doing using a quantum walk. This is an algorithm, which I won't have time to talk about, um, but I will give a reference on one of the next slides. Um, and a classical random walk put to good use, for example, lattice QCD calculations. So for particle physics, essentially um, it's Monte Carlo simulations to do random sampling. But now notice that you can also do a classical computer simulation of all of these four possibilities. Um, for example, here, um, of course, you can do simulations of particles and optical lattices. If you look for snakes and ladders online, you will find you can play it online. And of course, that's a computer simulation of the physical board game. Um, I've done classical computer simulations of a quantum computer running this algorithm. And this one, which seems the strangest thing to do, a classical computer simulation of a classical computer running a Monte Carlo calculation is actually the most scientifically useful. Um, when they were developing specialist hardware to speed up these calculations, they ran them as virtual machines. Um, so again, this makes sense. There are scientific papers written about this one. So you can end up with multiple levels of, of abstraction, simulations of simulations of quantum walks, and it's important to keep the levels of abstraction clear. So let's then think a little bit more um, broadly about what we're doing when we make our models in physics. So here's our electron and um, philosophers call this the representation relation, how we, what we, how we relate the physical object to our model of it. Here I've got a Schrodinger equation for an electron. Um, and so we've got spaces of abstract and physical objects. 
um, and the representation relation mediating. And this is theory dependent. So if you were doing electrostatics, you might not want this representation. You might want, want the electron to be a point charge if you're doing electric statics, and you might not need to worry about the quantum properties at that point. Um, so we can then draw, extend these diagrams and look at how we do science. Um, so here we have our physical system doing its thing. And then up here, we have our model of it. Um, and bit evolving under the model. So we get a prediction for what the state should be after time. And we can also take what we actually get in the experiment. And you see the prime is in a different place here. So what we want, if we've got a good physical theory for what our experiment, what our physical, what our, the world is doing, is we want these to be pretty close. Not necessarily identical, because we might know that we can't measure perfectly, and we might know our theory is approximate. Um, but at some level, what we mean by a good theory is it makes good predictions for what we actually find when we go and look. So that's a diagram for signs. Um, then we can make a diagram for technology. So once we have a good model, we can then specify what we want and engineer it so that we have a finished product that has the properties that we designed. And one of the things that we make, among many, are computers. So, um, so what we're doing when we compute, we've already engineered our computer here. There's some background noise. Is this? Um, Sorry, there we go. I'm now properly unmuted, I think. <laughs> good, good, good. Normally, I do not share the sessions. And uh, when I try, when there is some noise, I have to mute people. But when I try to mute people, the, it just move out. And I, and I... <laughs> sorry, the second yeah, time. Yeah, don't worry, don't worry. Anyway, so this is our picture in these, these nice diagrams of what it is to, to use a computer. Um, so we have our abstract problem. It's not related to the physical system that's the computer now. We have to do an encoding to map it into the, the way the computer works. Um, and then we run it and we, because we engineered it and we understand how it works very well, we have that the, the outcome is um, what it should be. And then we can decode. And from that, with high confidence, we have something that is the solution to our problem. Um, so that lets us think about requirements for, for computing. It's a high level process. Um, there are always outputs. If there was no output, we could replace it with a brick that did nothing. And there's a representational entity that owns the computation. So everything I've put here that said abstract, I'm not being a sort of Descartes dualist here. The abstract is instantiated in the representational entity. That doesn't need to be a human. Um, other creatures compute. Um, and we have a nice paper talking about bacteria computing here. Um, and, there's, and we also have some work talking more about how to model the representational entity and, and, and fit it into the picture. Um, so that's, that's the, the sort of diagram for computing. So if you hold on to that, here's a flattened version of it, where there's the input, our problem. We have that encoding step. 
Now we're going to encode it in a quantum state. And then we need some quantum evolution. So it will be unitary, could be open system, but that's um, equivalent for our purposes here. We don't need to worry about the difference. We get an output state, we decode, we get our result. Now, so then everything about building a quantum computer depends on what we're going to do with this evolution here. It could be a gate sequence. So that's the standard way of, rep, of talking about quantum computing. But we could also engineer a Hamiltonian such that the output state is the exponential of the time integral of the Hamiltonian. So this is just the formal solution of Schrodinger's equation. And this is just to remind us that these um, this doesn't commute here, so you have to do all of this in the right order. You have to take the time ordered integral here. So actually this model here covers most of quantum information processing, including communications, where what your aim is that your result is equal to your input. You've managed to get your message through your quantum network and get out the other end the message that you sent. And this also gives us one other property of information processing. The encoding involves arbitrary choices. So if we want to use spin down as zero instead of spin up, that's fine, so long as we make our encode and decode consistent with our choices for what to use to represent um, the, the data. So this is my uh, sort of two slide explanation of how quantum computing works or quantum information processing. Quantum logic is different from classical logic. Um, so the, our bits have become qubits where you can have a superposition and it has a coherence property here. So the alpha and beta are complex numbers and the phase here, so the complex phase, gives you the coherence. Um, in classical, you have binary decisions, yes and no. And in quantum, you get yes and no in superposition. So you can carry along both possibilities together in the, same, in the single quantum state. In classical, you have to add random numbers. But in quantum, you can get random measurement outcomes. In principle, randomness is built in. So this gives you different computation because the logic is different. And then the question is, how different is it? Does it give you an advantage? So for computability, so what you can compute, we think there is no difference. But for complexity, so how efficiently you can compute things, it differs. So some problems can be computed more efficiently. So that, of course, begs the question, what do you mean by efficient? Um, the theorists usually mean that efficient is polynomial scaling with the system size, with the problem size. But in practice, for computing things, what we want to, uh, are systems that, physical computers that produce answers on human timescales. Um, in the quantum case, roughly speaking, you will get a quadratic speed up, so a polynomial speed up that exploits the quantum coherence. So those interference effects up here. And if you want an exponential speed up, you have to exploit the parallelism you get with the superpositions. And, but the main thing to note here is that comparison of real physical devices is what counts for an actual advantage. And so complexity theory is useful, but it won't by itself, it won't tell you whether you can make, build a useful quantum computer. And the last thing to mention on that is the encoding does matter. Um, so this again is what is at some level completely obvious, but it's important not to forget it. Um, so if you want to encode numbers, um, you could do a unary encoding where when you had four, you had four things, um, or you could do a binary encoding or any other base for that matter. And so here now you have four represented as 
three bits and so eight then is four bits and so on. Um, so you end up with something that's much more efficient in terms of the number of bits you need versus the number of unary things that you would have needed for that encoding. Um, this isn't a quantum thing, but it's something not to forget for quantum computing. Um, and then, of course, floating point gives you even more efficient encoding, but you're trading precision um, for the more efficient encoding that you're using here. So let's think about how to encode our problems, and I'm talking about classical problems for the moment, into Hamiltonians that are going to act on qubits. So our qubits are going to represent numbers. So if we want the number j, then in binary, it's going to have bit values, zeros or ones as a whole bit string like this. So these are our bits, there are zeros or ones. And it's easy to write down a superposition of all the possible basis states, so all the possible numbers um, from zero to two to the n minus one for n qubits. Um, and that's just kind of a product of this uh, zero plus one state here. So that's tensored up. So that's n qubits tensored together like this. So if you multiply that out, you, can, you get all zeros, zero, zero, one. And so you can count in binary all the way up to one, 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 one. So now that gives us a possibility to represent any number up to um, two to the n minus one. Now we need to encode the problem we want to compute across those numbers into an n qubit Hamiltonian. So this is P for problem here. And we want to do it such that the solution state is the lowest energy state, so the ground state of the Hamiltonian. Um, so a really simple example is just the search problem. We want to find one state out of that, that all of those possible states, two to the n minus one of, of, of the n, then. And then we can just make a Hamiltonian that does the identity on everything except will make the mark state one unit of energy lower. So that obviously does the job, but on the other hand, you can't make that Hamiltonian without knowing the answer. So search in this setting is a toy problem. It's a test problem, but it's very useful for understanding how things work. Um, and so to demonstrate that you can do other things, you can encode other problems, Usually the problem is going to be specified as constraints. So think of it like Lagrange multipliers or other ways of imposing constraints on your, um, in your model. And so if you have a constraint where out of three of these qubits, um, exactly one of them must be one and the other two must be zero in the solution. If you do a term like this, so identity minus these, are sigma z, so they're Pauli sigma matrices, there it is here. Um, and if you then square that, that will uh, enforce this condition for its lowest energy state for that term. Um, so, and that we know how to do this um, for all sorts of different constraints. You can construct Hamiltonian terms out of these Pauli matrices um, that will encode the constraints such that the solution is the ground state of the whole Hamiltonian. And then you get a family of ways to compute in this Hamiltonian setting where you're going to compute in continuous time. Um, so there's our quantum walks, which is what we're really interested in. And there's adiabatic quantum computing, which I'm going to explain first because it's very obvious how it works. And then quantum annealing is somewhere in the middle where you're actively cooling things to take the energy out of the system and head towards the ground state. Um, so adiabatic quantum computing, it exploits the adiabatic theorem of um, the, in physics. So we take our Hamiltonian, we initialize the qubits in the ground state of a simpler Hamiltonian that's easy to prepare. And then we transform adiabatically. We start in with the Hamiltonian in the, the easy Hamiltonian. 
s when s is zero. And we slowly turn s up from zero to one until we've changed from having the easy Hamiltonian to the problem Hamiltonian. And if we do it slowly enough and the Hamiltonian is gapped, then we will end up in, with high probability, we'll end up in the solution state and we can measure and we've solved our problem. Um, so there, there's the adiabatic condition um, in terms of the rate of change, how fast we turn go from um, here, the zero Hamiltonian to the problem Hamiltonian. Um, and there's the square of the, the energy gap in the bottom there. Now, of course, there's all sorts of caveats with the adiabatic theorem, but remember we are engineering our Hamiltonians here. So we can ensure that we have a gapped Hamiltonian and that it will work as advertised. Um, we don't have to worry about the edge cases because that's we're building our own Hamiltonian here. But this is not sounding necessarily promising for getting a quantum speed up because, of course, epsilon needs to be small and you need to go slowly from here to here, especially if the gap is small. So it would be nice to try using quantum walks instead. Um, they run at the speed they run at. Um, there's no epsilon involved in quantum walks. So here's that definition of a continuous time quantum walk again. We have our adjacency matrix of our graph. It's actually more usual to use the Laplacian because it's easier um, to do the maths around the, the Laplacian. So we have a diagonal which is matrix, which is the degree of, the, of site J for the graph. Um, for regular graphs, this makes no difference. And we're going to be talking about regular graphs. Um, then we make our Hamiltonian, um, run it as before and measure at time T. So which graph should we use? Now, it turns out that for qubits, the graph you want to use is a hypercube. Um, so it's this one. So there's my sigma x. So that's um, from here. There's my Pauli sigma x. Oops. Um, and that's the diagonal term, because the degree of each vertex for a, a hypercube is n, the number of, of qubits. And so it's easiest to see what's going on here in pictures. So this is my graph labeled with the possible states of three qubits here. So these are the actual qubits we're going to use. We're going to encode our quantum walk into a quantum computer. So we have three qubits here, and they are representing the cube here. The, the sites of the cube. And so the quantum walk is going to be on this cube in Hilbert space. And in physical space, we have our, our, our three qubits here. The little dotted red lines are what the prob are going to be the problem Hamiltonian. So they're going to be interactions between them to add the problem Hamiltonian to it. So I just drew the one, two, and three qubit versions so you can see that this continues to end quite smoothly. So here's how you do search in this setting. Um, so there's our problem Hamiltonian. Um, and the easy Hamiltonian is going to be that hypercube Hamiltonian. Um, it's easy to, um, to, to prepare the ground state. It's just that equal superposition state over all of the, um, the, the cube the possible states of the qubits. And that makes sense because to start with, we don't know what the marked state is. So we want to make all the states equally probable. Then we apply our time evolution. And after a suitable time TF, um, which is proportional to the square root of the, um, the number of possible states, um, that will give us a quadratic speed up. This is just an aside for how you're, you can um, actually create this Hamiltonian. It's non-trivial, but you can do it. So that means you can use the search problem to test real quantum hardware. Um, but that's outside the, I don't have time to talk about the details of that. Sorry, one question. 
Okay, yes. In the previous slide. So in the previous, uh, you were showing, so in, typically you have, uh, can you go to the previous slide, please? Sure, sure. This one. There you go. No, no, not the full one. Okay. The one in the middle, if <laughs> you jump to. This one, yes. Okay. So you you were showing before uh, one case in which you are doing a search problem, and then you write the Hamiltonian in this way, in which you have the M cat, cat bra states, and this is the state that is actually your target. When you do that, the new um, setup in which you consider this hypercube Hamiltonian, um, I do not see uh, which is the relation. So is this like saying that the state that you are searching is the superposition of all state? Is just like an arbitrary, is able to search only that state? I do not see the connection between the two points because M in the first uh, description you did for the searching problem, it, it was known, but at least it was arbitrary. While here, this hypercube Hamiltonian seems to be something defined in terms of this superposition. So maybe I missed something. Can you comment? this okay so m is a bit string um so let me go back to um here so just like j m is a bit string so it's what but it's a particular bit string um and out, out of all the possible ones um so i'm and so when does it help so in this case it could be any one of these bit strings that that label the the sides, but only one of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, and as I said when I first introduced it, obviously you need to know what M is to set up this Hamiltonian. So you can't set it up for an unknown M. Um, so it's a toy problem in that sense. Yes. Right. Um, I will show you a real problem where you don't need to know the answer to set it up as the next thing I, I talk about. So this is very much, search in this setting is very much something that is studied as a toy problem. It's not a, re a computation you could really get, um, you really implement. Um, there are ways you can use it as a subroutine, um, but again, that's beyond the scope of what I'm, I'm talking about here. What I'm trying to get here is some intuition for how it works to set something up so you're looking for the ground state. Does that help? Yes, the, the other thing is that I didn't see how now when you, in the previous, in the adiabatic process you were mentioning, I can start from an Hamiltonian which I uh, go, uh, if I have the, the ground state and this gap, then I move and I arrive to the fundamental state of the more complicated situation. But here actually uh, the superposition is not the ground state. It's just an, it just it's it's the a, ground state of this Hamiltonian alone, this piece alone. Ah, it is. The, the, the superposition is this ground state. Okay. That's yeah, it. so it's the ground state of, of this Hamiltonian. Ah, okay, because you have all the, yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. the minus signs there are important. Otherwise, okay. you have different signs. But, but yeah, it's the ground state of this Hamiltonian. And what I've done here with my A and B is I've allowed it to be general so I can be a walk or adiabatic. Because on the next slide, I have pictures, which may help. Okay, thank you. Okay, so on this slide, I have pictures where there's the adiabatic, where it goes steadily up in probability. This is the probability of ending up in the mark state. Um, on this oscillating one is what the quantum warp does. So you need to measure at more something like a time when it's, it's reasonably high. And then you can do something that's hybrid between the two like this. Um, so they're very much related. It's how you do the time varying or not um, between the quantum walk Hamiltonian and the problem Hamiltonian. Um, but obviously you need to know to do this, you either need a function for S of T. So in this picture, the function I'm using is these um, curves here, or you need gamma. Um, and this is essentially gamma because we just turn it on and run it if it's the quantum walk. Um, 
So this is how to solve analytically the search problem. In a continuous time, the, you can search, you can solve the search algorithm in many different graph settings, because in the large end limit, they all reduce to a two dimensional subspace, the two lowest energy levels, the ground state and the first excited state. Um, and that, of course, is equivalent to one qubit, and you can solve that analytically. Um, and it looks something um, like this for the adiabatic case. Um, here's our Z here. Um, and remember, this is mapped now. So my ground state is zero, and my first excited state is one. And so we're going from this Hamiltonian where this is very negligible to this one. Um, so you solve the eigen system, you get the energy gap, and then remember that condition, adiabatic condition. If you set that up to insist that that is maintained to epsilon, you end up with a differential equation for how you vary s of t. Um, and it comes, you comes out um, looking like this, and in the limit of very small gap, which is equivalent to very large n, um, you end up with this function, which is essentially a cotangent, and that is more or less what I plotted here. Is there's, there's the cotangent function going on here? Um, so that's um, get, that now gives us the adiabatic, the, the S of T. For gamma, it that occurs when S is a half. Um, so it sets gamma as a half. And it reduces to rabbi flops, where you just have the, the, the sigma x just rotating your qubit from 0 to 1, and so on. And then you can set up a hybrid one um, that looks complicated, but I'm just interpolating between here and here. So you can see this is a little bit flatter. And so you can prove that any, therefore, that any of the um, hybrid between quantum walk and adiabatic will give you the quantum speed up. So that's nice, but I will need to speed up a little if we're going to finish this talk and not run way over. Um, so let's jump. What we'd really like to, to see is that we can solve a more realistic problem with quantum walks. Um, in fact, it's been known that quantum walks can solve the search problem for a long time, but nobody tried to get them to solve anything else. So we tried. Um, and we picked Sherrington Kirkpatrick spin glasses. Um, they're frustrated spin systems. Um, it's MP hard to find the ground state if you set it up with the right parameters. So we expect a polynomial speed up here. We don't expect an exponential speed up. Um, and these have been studied before um, for adiabatic quantum computing, which can find ground states faster than getting. Um, and then we chose them because they're more like realistic hard optimization problems while still being a well understood, uh, analytically well understood problem. So this is their definition. So here's my sigma z's. So actually, it's a classical spin problem we're solving here. So um, you can think of these as classical spin operators, and then you just quantize it by making these operators as sigma z operators. Um, so we have coupling between pairs, these um, JK terms, and we have fields applied to individual spins. And they are all drawn from a Gaussian distribution with mean zero, that to make the problem hardest. Um, the same Gaussian distribution in this case for all of them. And what we, as I say, what we want to ask is whether continuous time quantum walks can solve this problem rather than just the search problem. So we've just put this Hamiltonian in here, and we've kept the same Hamil um, hypercube Hamiltonian here. And we're going to compare it with a random energy model where you just you take the same system of spins, but now you define it, 
the eigen energies are now randomly drawn from a Gaussian distribution. This was defined in this paper here, deliberately to be hard, if not impossible, to do with um, adiabatic quantum computing. So the first thing we need to know is what our hopping rate needs to be. Um, so we investigated this numerically. Um, so the relative weight of the, the Hamiltonian components here, the, the hypercube and the, the spin glass Hamiltonian. And what we find, what we're calculating here, I'll define on the next slide, um, it's easy to calculate from the spectrum. So if you diagonalize this full matrix, you can then calculate this easily for different gammas. And what we find is that We've got nice broad peaks here for the probability of finding the, the ground state. Um, but if you compare that with the random energy model, they have very that has very narrow peaks and the peaks are not always in the same place. So see, this is just from zero to one. So it's this little range here compared to these broad peaks, which are across several units. So that's good because it means we don't have to be very accurate with choosing our hopping rate. We can do something heuristic and it should work. So now we need to know how long to run for. Um, and when you run it, instead of having nice oscillations like search, you get something rather spiky like this. So it's not at all clear to when, how to decide when to measure. So what we do is we randomly sample. Um, and that lets us we measure at random times, fairly short times, and that lets us sample from the time average probability distribution. And if I plot that, it looks like this. So you can see it converges quite quickly. And we find numerically that it really does can only give us a log n factor here. So it seems to be n to the three quarters. This is probably related to the critical exponents of the spin glass, but um, we haven't been able to pin that down. Um, so what we're going to do is sample in a time window delta t that's proportional to little n, so it's efficient to do this. Um, after running for a short time just to settle down, get the, dis the average to settle. And if we do this, here's some results. So what we're looking at on here, it's a log scale here and the number of qubits up to 20, which is as many as we could simulate. And this would be random guessing, one over n. This would be a quadratic speed up, one over square root of n. And here you can see what we get. We're doing better than guessing and we're doing better than uh, a quadratic speed up, which the search algorithm would give us. So that's our P infinity. Um, and you can see it's basically almost identical to this short time average here. Um, and this is for a heuristic choice of gamma. So it's not um, the, the, this is for the exact gamma. And then this, this one is the heuristic. And they're within errors, they're pretty much the same. And to the minus 0.41. Um, not minus 0.5 would be search. So now there's a lot of lines on this plot over here. So that looks great. It looks like we're getting a quantum advantage until you ask what the best classical algorithm is. And that's this green line here. It's a branch and bound algorithm. And we're getting about minus 0.37. So we haven't beaten that. And there's a quantum version of that. This is Ashley Montanaro's work. Um, where he's getting something more like this here. So this is more like 0.28 for the, or 0.27 for the quantized quantum version of this branch and bound algorithm. Now up here, we have something that looks much better. We're down at about minus 0.15. But we, at some level, we cheated to get this. We wanted to know if we put a little bit of quantum annealing in as well as the quantum walk, how good could you get? And then we went, okay, how do we do this without cheating? So I'm going to tell you about that here, but first I'm going to explain why it is that we're, what we're doing that lets us beat search. 
Um, so we did a little experiment with our random energy model and our spin glasses. So this blue line is the blue line from the previous results at, at minus 0.41. And we took our random energy model and we added pairwise correlations into it. We did that with a gray code. Um, I can explain in detail how we did it, but it, it doesn't make the problem hard, but it does make, mean you can do something comparable. And you can see it's got the same kind of scaling as the spin glasses. And then we took the spin glasses and re removed the correlations by taking the eigenvalues and scrambling them so that they are distributed more like the random energy model. And that shoots it up here. So it looks like the random energy model. And we also removed the correlations from the driver Hamiltonian, so this hypercube quantum walk Hamiltonian, by putting it on a complete graph instead. And so all of those give you these lines. And they look like they're doing better. We've got a higher probability. But we need to know that gamma exactly. They've got those really sharp gamma peaks, and you don't know gamma exactly. So you can't do this. It's cheating to get those lines. So what's worth going on here is that real problems have correlations. If you exploit them, you can solve them more efficiently. Um, that's what AI and machine learning does in effect is it's looking for correlations hidden in the data. But it's also what we do with Monte Carlo sim, uh, simulations where we do single spin flips or bit flips and then take them if the, 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 the random bit flip gives you a better answer. Um, so you need to match the correlations here, these pairwise correlations with the driver Hamiltonian, which is this single spin flips here. And this again is not necessarily something new. It corresponds to what we know works with, with Monte Carlo simulations. And remember that we choose the Hamiltonian to encode our problem in, so we can arrange that we have pairwise correlations representing our, um, our problem. So briefly here then, we have developed some techniques in order to improve both adiabatic and quantum annealing. Um, this is quantum annealing, really, because it's running very fast, um, and quantum walks um, by providing ways to choose to do two successive quantum walks, say, with different hopping rates, and that can improve how, far, how well you find the solution. Um, so this essentially is doing something similar to that calculation for solving the search problem that I showed you with a single qubit, but it's doing it in a local subspace for these more complicated problems. And just to finish up, what I've been telling you about is all about using quantum walks to solve classical problems. So it's universal for classical, but not for quantum problems. But quantum co walks are indeed universal for quantum computing. Um, here's the papers with um, proofs of that for continuous time and discrete time. Um, but mostly what this is telling you is that you can implement a quantum walk efficiently on a quantum computer because you must encode it in qubits to get the uh, quantum advantage here. Um, so what you take, for example, is a gate model circuit like this, and it turns into a quantum walk on a graph that looks like this. So you can see the gates lurking in here um, in the way it's been done. Um, so there's the different gates. But, uh, um, but you wouldn't implement it physically on a graph like this. You do it in qubits. So if you want, however, a physical quantum walk that's going to be universal, you can take multiple quantum walkers and make them interact. And otherwise, you get quantum cellular automata. And they are known to be universal for quantum computing. Um, there's a nice overview here from Carolina Wiesner um, from 2008. Um, so you know it's more than a decade ago, but it's still a good introductory overview. Um, and this is the much more um, complicated to follow paper because it has proofs in it 
on how to construct a universal quantum computation using M walkers on L sites. You can do this in experiments. So there, if you put many uh, particles in an optical lattice, you can make a quantum cellular automata out of it. If they don't interact, what you get is boson sampling, which you may have heard of. And it's got somewhere intermediate between classical and quantum computing in terms of how its computational power. If you've got fermions, that's easy because you only have ever have two at once at a site. Um, so that you can simulate quite easily. So in summary, I've told you about how you can use quantum walks to find spin glass ground states, which is showing they can be used for um, something like a practical problem. Um, I've shown how you can use do both um, computation in general with continuous time, of which quantum walks are one piece of that picture. And I've also told you some stuff about abstraction representation theory framework for thinking about computation in general and its relationship between engineering and science. Um, and here's a few more paper references for this. So a little word about what more. We're looking, checking things work for other problems like max two set. This is a challenge to find a a quantum algorithm to beat classical because there are very, very efficient classical algorithms for, Mac, for SAP problems. Um, so Ashley Montanaro's branch and bound algorithm is a discrete time quantum walk algorithm. And we'd like a continuous time version. Um, we're developing more tools for algorithm design um, on the back of um, the rapid quench paperwork. And I've also been looking at open systems effects um, in that very simple search setting of the single avoided crossing model. So I'll leave you with the references there and thank you very much. Thank you very much. So maybe we have, a, we, have we are a little bit late, but if there are a couple of questions, we can ask questions now. Are there any questions or comments? Maybe, maybe I would like to, to start because there is uh, some, something I didn't get when you were explaining. You started introducing the Sherry to give Patrick Hamiltonian and then you were telling, okay, this Hamiltonian can be classical or quantum. And then in the, at some point you thought it was classical, but then in the old derivation, you are speaking about coherency and so on. And I think it is quantum at the end. So I missed when it was classical and when it was quantum. You are okay. the ground state of which one? Okay, let me go back. Um little bit too far. Let's, here we go. So the problem Hamiltonians in this setting, um, actually, we could go back even further for this to how to encode in to qubit Hamiltonians. So the problems I'm encoding in Hamiltonians here um, are all classical problems. Okay. So I'm, I'm using a a Hamiltonian, essentially, I didn't say that this explicitly, but I'm using the transverse icing Hamiltonian as my sort of physical tool to build my quantum computer with. Mm -hmm. um, and so the icing Hamiltonian alone is classical. It's just, right, it spins. Um, so it's, it's spin up or spin down. It's a classical spin Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. What makes it quantum? is to add the transverse field. So now you have a, 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 a Z and an X, sigma Z and a sigma X in the same Hamiltonian. Um, and that's, that's where the quantum comes in. But the problems I'm encoding are all classical and I'm encoding them into spins that just have spin up and spin down. Um, so the answer is a classical bit string. Um, and you know, nothing I'm doing to the problem is making the problem quantum, right? What I'm using is a quantum computer where the, the, the sigma x is giving me bit flips and it's allowing superpositions of possible answers. But the ground state I'm looking for is going to be a single bit string because um, it's, because it's a, 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 the ground state of a, a classical Hamiltonian. Okay. So, um, so then, so if I go back to 
where I do the, the, this one, that you see it only has sigma z's in it, yeah? So essentially, and as, as defined by Sherrington and Kirkpatrick, this is a classical frustrated spin system. Okay. Um, and then the quantum bit here, this is my, my sigma x's or whatever other quantum warp piece of the that I choose here. And when I put the two together, I, it needs to be a quantum system to, to implement both of those at once. Okay, thank you, Miss, when you were. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other comments? If not, I have a last question, a last comment, but uh, let's see if someone else says. So maybe a last um, thing that is not related to what you explained, but is just out of curiosity. Uh, is there any way to put into this framework also related to the first part of your uh, discussion that was more uh, epistemological, let's say, is there any way to include also the quantum measurements at some point that you need to introduce? So you were having this entity you have been- Ah, okay, okay. So yeah, so quantum metrology, um, in is what is in a sense what you're asking uh, about the mm -hmm. so if we're going back to let me see how far I can jump with this um, I mean jump somewhere back um, so do I have no 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 this is probably where um, where I want to be for this. So um, you can, um, so there is, there is by impl implication in here, we're classical here, okay? We prepare our quantum state, we run our quantum time evolution, and then by implication we measure here. So this piece is again classical. So actually, if you look at most quantum computing algorithms, they have, classical beginnings and ends to them, at least. Um, so for quantum, for metrology to get an advantage out of quantum measurements, you can set it up to look like this um, because you can write it to look very much like beam splitters, a beam splitter network. So I have slides for that, but of course not in this talk. So I can't easily go and pull one up to, to show you that. Um, but what it looks like, so the, the U here then turns into a Hadamard here and a Hadamard here. That's the beam splitters of the, the interferometer. And then in the middle, there's a phase shift, which is the thing that you're trying to use to measure the, the, the quantum metrology to measure and to measure more accurately than you could classically. So you can put it into this framework with a very specific U here for the the program, if you like, that is is what the, the metrology looks like. Okay, so you have yeah. everything: computing, metrology, and uh, communications. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay. but uh, but yeah, so um, so it's 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 stretching. It as I say, you can put it in that framework, um, and it's useful for some people to see it that way, so they can see where you know, the, the quantum operations are producing the, the advantage, but you have to analyze. So the input encoding and decoding and result, you have to think of that differently because for quantum measurement, it has to be a physical interferometer, actually. Um, you don't do it in qubits. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Deep, thank you very much for your talk. And uh, we are a little bit late. If there are no further questions, we, we conclude here. So if no questions, okay. Thank you very much. And hope to see you here. Ciao. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.